I'm Marshall Kozlov, and this is Arsenal of Democracy. Never before has our American civilization been in such danger as now. Danger against which we must prepare. But we well know that we cannot escape danger by crawling into bed and pulling the covers over our heads. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. My guest today is Sham Sankar, the Chief Technology Officer of Palantir, one of the country's leading defense technology companies. In this conversation, we discuss the role that software plays in the modern arsenal of democracy, Palantir's history, transitioning from the war on terror era to the era of great power competition, and of course, conversations around reforming defense contracting in the face of technological innovation and challenges to the modern defense industrial base. My mantra here is that M-Day was yesterday. If we want to deter the conflict, we need to actually start mobilizing now so that we're not caught in a position where we're unable to do anything about it. Some of these things do require lead time. They require readiness. Uh, and so I think the hard part here is, you know, there isn't a political consensus that would say we can all mobilize. But mm -hmm. there wasn't one at the dawn of World War II either. Uh, you know, prior to that, it was really a handful of industrialists saying, we're going to do this. We're, we're going to be ready just in case. Today's industrialists look differently. Yes, they are manufacturing companies. They are you know, American industry. But in a way that it has, has no historical analog, they are software companies. They are technology institutions. Hope you all enjoy the conversation. Sham Sankar, welcome to Arsenal of Democracy. It's great to be uh, back with you, Marshall. Yeah, great to chat with you. We did a great episode on my other podcast, The Realignment, back at the RNDF last December. So if you all have a good time with this episode, be sure to check that one out as well. So let's start here. The arsenal of democracy, beyond just the name of this podcast, obviously evokes a certain image of the United States, often at its best when it came to our industrial might during World War II. Taking us into the 2020s, I'd be curious to hear from you as Palantir's CTO, where do you think software fits within that arsenal in terms of how we should conceptualize our disadvantages and advantages right now? Yeah, you know, at the precipice of World War II, we were the world's best at mass production. We had just figured it out. Uh, and we, we used that to great effect. That was our strategic advantage. Uh, I think when we look at that history, we need to recognize that we mobilized ahead of an actual war starting. Like Lend-Lease was hugely valuable took us 12 months to build factories. It took us six months to retool them. Uh, so when I look at the present moment, we're no longer the best at mass production, but we are the best at software by a yawning margin. You know, in so somehow we kind of forget that there are zero Chinese enterprise software companies that are competitive on the world stage. There are zero Indian enterprise software companies competitive on the world stage. There is clearly something more than just raw IQ about getting software to work at scale. It's cultural. And that culture exists at scale only in America. So this is a unique advantage we have. And I think we can see how software, we, you know, Andreessen has talked about how software eats the world. Well, software ate the car. You know, people laughed at Tesla until they realized, actually, Tesla made a software-defined vehicle. The old truism that the moment you drive your car off the lot, it depreciates by 10%. It's not so true with the Tesla, actually. You know, this car is continuously getting updated, and we saw that reflected in resale values. So somehow software is breaking all the rules. And I think we need to honor the fact that we're the world's best at it. It allows us to redefine the rules that are in favor of the West, in favor of freedom and prosperity, and that we need to be wielding that as we think about what constitutes the arsenal of democracy today. So what are the mission sets that you see software is providing either a means of addressing or a leverage point that policymakers and folks in the DOD could actually use? Uh, I don't want to be too reductionist about it, but I think what's really important is this elegant integration of the humans that we have with software. We, we can almost better think of all of the software as an Iron Man suit for the, for the, for the humans who do the job. As, as uh, Colonel Boyd said, you know, terrain doesn't fight wars, machines don't fight wars, humans do. And this whole, the OODA loop that he pioneered, observe, orient, decide, act, that's where I see the greatest leverage coming from software. It's not about the data, it's about the decisions. And so it's about um, wielding software to achieve decision advantage. Now, when you frame it that way, you recognize, of course, 
the concept of JADZ2 makes sense, right? It's how do you integrate all of your sensors, all of your shooters to capture that decision advantage or information dominance? That's fundamentally a software problem. It's not a hardware problem. And then that allows you to replan how you're going to approach these things. I think that presents us with enormous numbers of challenges. The, the first amongst which is, are we even organized for a world that looks like that? In software, we have the concept of Conway's law, which is that every institution ends up shipping a product, a software product, that is a reflection of how they themselves are organized. So if we thought mm. about the DOD and the service level organization, which is sacrosanct, Actually, it's kind of hard to think about how are you going to achieve true JADC2, uh, JADC2 if, if everyone is going to be developing their own individual software. Like we're going to, of course, get something that is reflective of the way we're organized today. And I think we've seen uh, a lot of the success from the OSD level efforts meet that moment. But also it kind of runs counterculture to how people like things to be delivered through the mill devs. Something I'm really curious about, you did a favor to me as a guest by being on this real tear of a media tour. Everyone from like the deep policy experts who are focused on these issues to just big popular podcasters. So that actually gave me a really wide sway of topics folks are interested in. And a reaction I had to so many of those interviews, especially the ones that were SV and tech focused, was a real interest in the most futuristic aspects of these tech AI and defense topics. So this image of AI fundamentally shifting the battlefield, this image of drones, the image of, oh, wow, Houthi rebels could launch missiles and drones at our actual ships. How does that change the way we procure capital ships? And how does that change the way we approach those sort of asymmetric conflicts? However, all of that is very valid. And obviously, that's going to attract the interest of Silicon Valley. If I look to the war in Ukraine now, I think of manpower shortages. I think of artillery, um, ammunition, um, manufacturing related troubles. Ukraine is struggling, not because they're being overwhelmed by 5,000 drones, but because Russia is fighting a very, once again, World War style war. So as someone who's been on this tour, thinking about this at the DOD level, but also at the very everyman tech level, how would you really define the way we should think of the present moment in technological terms without being overly futuristic in a way that's totally separated from our actual active battlefield challenges. I think that's a great point. We can over-exoticize the technology. And that's one of the things I've been talking about, which is I think there's this way in which as technology has become more complicated, we've kind of lost the, the, the connection to its implementation. It's mm. one thing to come up and develop new capabilities. It's another thing to implement those capabilities. There's this old saying in Silicon Valley that there's the first 80% and the second 80%. And, um, you know, because people kind of trivialize whichever end of the problem they don't end up owning as the easy part. Uh, and I think this has really happened. It's not it's not unique to government, actually. It's happened in the commercial world where people kind of cargo cult various architectures or technologies like this is the approach. If I just buy this widget or this box, it means I've done the right thing. And of course, the cargo cult is, is a re I've, I've realized this is not a, a totally um, well understood reference, but it's a reference to the, the Melanesians in the South Pacific who during World War II, when they saw U.S. troops marching around or using hand signals or building air traffic control towers, these amazing steel beasts would land with Coca-Cola and radios and amazing futuristic technologies. So then one day the, the, the steel beasts stopped arriving. So they started to do what they saw U.S. service members doing. They dressed up in fatigues. They marched with, with sticks, you know, whittled down to resemble rifles. They built fake airfields. They cleared the ground. But of course, the steel planes never returned, right? So there's a way in which we have lost the fundamental connection to how to use technology to achieve advantage. And so that now comes back to your question, like, yes, manpower matters, munition matters, production matters. The question is how you wield your software to drive those decisions. Uh, readiness is, is something you can achieve. It's a problem to be managed every day, not a problem to be solved. And so where do you spend your limited time and attention to achieve the projection of force that you need across manning, equipping, and training people? How do you reflect that into the industrial base so that you have some connection from the foxhole to the factory floor? How do you create more levers that you can pull on? So you can think about it as um, software should be able to push out the efficient frontier and what's possible. How do I use my, at, at the point, and actually we just saw this in the, in, in the, mm. in the Middle East theater where I'm actually going to use different munitions because I can achieve the same effect 
but the consequences on resupply and readiness are better if I use this munition versus that munition. And so being able to have that visibility at the point of decision-making is absolutely massive. That is information dominance and cascading that as you keep going. So I, I think that's the, the pragmatic implication of this. It's not the killer drones. It's not Skynet. It's actually being able to see yourself much better and understand and simulate the consequences of every decision you're going to make so you don't have regret. I think that goes to your point around iron, the Iron Man suit and thinking through the actual questions in front of you. So let's just kind of take a step back. I first got in touch with you because I was really interested in the way you framed Palantir's efforts in these categories around the fact that we're in an era of great power competition. Um, Palantir obviously comes around as a company in the wake of 9-11, an era which is really defined by asymmetric conflict and obviously the war on terror. Could you just kind of recount the history for listeners who haven't engaged your work before of understanding how Palantir structured itself for the war on terror moment? And as we transition into great power competition and the questions that are raised around the defense industrial base, how do you think of your work evolving to fit that nature? Yeah, so when we first started, really, we wanted to solve a handful of problems related to counterterrorism for a handful of institutions in the world. And we had taken this approach that we pioneered at PayPal to fight fraud, which was PayPal's existential problem. You know, it's not that hard to send money back and forth online. It's really hard to do that without being defrauded by the Russian mob. Uh, and so that was, that was the, the critical insight. How do you solve that? That essentially I would summarize as kind of like having an Iron Man suit for the humans. Humans are quite special, actually. So how do you project their intuitions and scale it to a phenomenon where you don't have a large end of prior occurrences, just like CT? But what we realized when we started engaging with the government is that unlike a company like PayPal, that's essentially a modern institution that had all of its data structured and integrated, the hard problem in government started first there, that uh you had systems that were written 40 years ago, right next to systems written 40 minutes ago that were eye-watering and how exquisite they are. But the challenge was how do you get all of this information to integrate across this so that you can make a decision, so that you can proverbially connect the dots. And of course, how do you do that securely? How do you do that respecting classification? How, how do you govern that stuff? The founding impetus for us was not just, hey, we want to prevent terrorism. Of course we do. We also want to prevent the reaction to terrorism which is often a kind of shift to, to reduce civil liberties, to give up privacy in, in the name of achieving security. But our experience kind of taught us that we were more likely to end up in a world where you had both less privacy and less security, and that there, there was a role for technology. You know, the, the, the objective of politics, I think, is for, for people to decide where on the efficient frontier we should be as a, as a democratic mm. society between these trade-offs. The role for engineers is to figure out how we can push out the efficient frontier. So for any... Any place on the frontier where you want to be with security, I can give you more privacy than you could have had with prior technology. And that's a, that's a unique role that we cannot, um, that technologists have to show up and deliver that. Now, that was kind of our feeling in this world where, by and large, at that time, no one in the Valley was interested in working with government at all. And I'd say even and at that time, it was actually for more pedestrian reasons. If we went to 2006, it would be like, well, it's impossible to build a business with the government. It's not even a political objection. That, that kind of came later, uh, you know, a decade or so following that. Uh, but now, of course, and we, if we transition to, to great power competition, I think one of the things that happened in the intervening time, so as we worked on counterterrorism, we were also building a commercial business, helping mm -hmm. actually people who build things, you know, the Airbuses, the BMWs, the Eatons, the Terras, you know, so mid-market manufacturers all the way to the largest companies in the world, helping them build things, helping them manage their production, their supply chain, quality, how they monitor the equipment they build once they put it into service, everything that connects them from their suppliers to their customers. And when we look at this, so it, it gives us a, a, a deep perspective into production, the industrial base in the broad sense, not just defense industrial base, but the industrial base and how this stuff is working today. And a huge amount of conviction that there is a big opportunity to catalyze the reindustrialization of America, leveraging our greatest strength, which is software, you know, ours and the nation's greatest strength. Uh, and and I, I call that software-defined production. I think in many ways, the modern manufacturers have kind of shown that, whether it's scaled companies like Tesla or new entrants and challengers like Hadrian who are building autonomous factories. There's, there's clearly a way of doing this that allows us to, to drive prosperity and the reindustrialization that maybe is a consequence of the flawed industrial policy starting in the 90s, uh, but to do so in a way that also promotes freedom and prosperity and deters future conflict. 
I think what's so interesting about the story you told there, and I think it's very helpful that you said, 2006, there's skepticism, but it's purely business skepticism. 2010s, you obviously see the employee revolts at Google over working with the Pentagon DOD. But now today, we're at a kind of interesting space where if you actually talk to people at venture firms in these tech companies, there are plenty of minds, bodies, et cetera, that are interested in not only building in these spaces, but also in funding these spaces. We've kind of had the, pe the pendulum swing in another direction because there's a recent Wall Street Journal piece that I'm sure you saw that was discussing how, okay, so for the first time ever, we have a lot of money from the venture capital industry unironically interested at a deep level in putting money into critical sectors that serve the national interest, especially in defense. Um, the article basically says, to a certain degree, this has been met with a shrug. Uh, by the DOD. Um, we've gone from a world where, uh, you know, half a percent of spending went to these sort of companies in 2010 to a world where it's now 1%. Um, relative to, I think, the opportunity you're describing at the start of this episode, clearly that's still small. So how would you define the status quo? Where it's not that we're worrying about Google revolting, I think we're actually worried about either a translation issue, either founders and companies aren't delivering the products that DOD needs, or DOD isn't open enough in its ideas and processes to actually take in those companies. I'd love to hear just like your perspective yeah. on that dilemma. So as someone who's been doing this for about 18 years, I think we have to acknowledge that a huge amount of progress has been made, but actually the majority of the work is still in front of us. So, you know, 18 years ago, I, I, it, I, as I often say, it was easier to get started working with the intelligence community than DOD. There was no front door for the sorts of technology new entrants. There was no DIU. There was, you know, there was no way of getting access to these problems. Um, so InQtel was really that front door for the intelligence community. And as a consequence, we really started there. Now, if you look at the present day DOD, it couldn't be, there are multiple front doors. You can get it through windows. You can get through front doors. People <laughs> care about this problem. They are focused on it. I think one of the, the changes that we have yet to see is really this deep internalization of, you know, where do we believe in having a true monopsony and where do we want to rely on market forces? I, I think one of the ironies is that structurally, not, not philosophically, um, the DOD is the place that, that kind of believes in market capitalism the least. You know, you know we have uh, single concentrated buyers, no competition within the government. You know, the government tends to focus on how competitive is the industrial base. That's an important question. But when you think about how do big companies actually run themselves, like how often are you financing multiple projects at the same time? Like competition as a dynamic to drive innovation, to spur urgency, it's a really important human factor. It, it goes beyond just simply a consequence of the markets. Um, and, you know, there, there are ways in which when you're the sole buyer of an aircraft carrier, it actually, it's a really hard job. I don't envy that job. You don't get to benefit from anyone else's amortized R&D. You don't get to, you know, every sort of technology insertion rests on you. So I think finding ways to actually draft off innovation and the market forces is going to be critical to modernizing our approach to acquisition. I think that's the gap that's remaining. Uh, so Chris Bros kind of calls this the money ball of military. There, there's another way of doing this. You're buying things where you're not looking to, to use them forever. You expect to replace them. You expect to have multiple entrants. You expect to have competition. And I think it, as we see with the kind of events unfolding in the world, a larger and larger part of the military can actually be serviced really well with this sort of approach. Uh, and so we've made huge progress, but I think the remaining progress is really about taking responsibility for the outcomes for these companies, which is a very uncomfortable place for the government to be, but it has, it is the place it's always been in. You know, when, when we needed to figure out titanium production, the government invested a lot in helping fund the underlying technologies that would pull through the companies for, to meet their ultimate needs around aerospace production and capabilities. So they were, you can think about it, that prior time in the 50s and 60s, they were really operating as someone managing the market, thinking about where they needed to be the sole buyer and where they could have this middle layer of market incentives drive the innovation and adoption. And it's a more holistic ownership of, of the problem. But I think the great power, great power competition requires exactly that. And it also requires, as a consequence, if once you do that, it will enable mm -hmm. entrepreneurs and the true American innovative spirit to go deliver against some of these problems. The Bob Noises of the world, the Elon Musk of the world, people who are otherwise going to be outside the system. They're not gonna be working at traditional defense companies. And I think that's really important because at the dawn of World War II, 
we did not have an industri- uh, a, a defense industrial base. We had an American industrial base. Uh, and I think the present moment is the one that we should view as the aberration. And that actually, that is the sustainable equilibrium where our companies, by and large, do both. An idea that you've surfaced, and it's been very helpful for my thinking, frankly, has been this concept of M-Day. Um, obviously, M-Day, I would love for you to explain the idea here, is referencing to this period before um, the U.S. entered World War II. But explain the concept and put that in the context t- today of how you are thinking through these challenges, especially in the industrial base. Yeah. So, so M-Day was this uh, idea before World War II that, look, we, we can kind of, when, we're, when we need to mobilize, that's what the M stands for, when we need to mobilize, we can essentially press the equivalent of a button and turn on war production and a war economy. Of course, it, it, it's not really believable, but that was essentially the plan. And I think if we look at back and see what actually happened, you see that industry mobilized one to two years ahead of time, uh, taking on their own risk, financing these things, getting, getting involved. So this sort of, my mantra here is that M-Day was yesterday. Like if we want to deter the conflict, we need to actually start mobilizing now so that we're not caught in a position where we're unable to do anything about it. Uh, some of these things do require lead time. They require readiness. Uh, and so I think the hard part here is, you know, there isn't a political consensus that would say we can all mobilize, but mm-hmm. there wasn't one at the dawn of World War II either. Uh, you know, prior to that, it was really a handful of industrialists saying, we're going to do this. We're, we're going to be ready just in case. And I think today's industrialists look differently. Yes, they are manufacturing companies. They are, you know, American industry, but in a way that it has, has no historical analog, they are software companies. They are technology institutions. Something I'm really curious about, because you're referencing that M day was yesterday bit of writing. You and your team have done an honestly insane amount of writing around these topics um, since around September. You had the first breakfast blog. There's always all this writing, all, the, all these podcasts. I'm just actually really curious, what has been the in-industry reaction to your thought? What have you learned from going on this tour, from writing on these topics? Um, because if things, it, it feels as if we're at a point where everyone's kind of thinking about these things and you're particularly aggressive in putting yourself forward. But I'd love to you to explain to the audience where you see industry reacting to these ideas. Yeah, I, I think the reaction amongst let's call it new entrance in defense tech and the capital class, the VCs, has been overwhelmingly positive. And I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Like the, the work that we're doing by opening up our infrastructure uh, shrinks the valley of death for these companies. It makes them more capital efficient. It gives them a better chance of, of surviving and driving the impact that they founded themselves to go do. Uh, the reaction with government is they're, they're still trying to understand how does this completely help them. And I'd say it's more of a bifurcated response. So, so particularly people who have been with us for a while, they understand our infrastructure, not just our software. They understand how this is the easy path to, to bringing and creating a multi-vendor Big Ten ecosystem. Or in, in simple English, how do I leverage all of America's innovative companies and have the flexibility to swap in and out new capabilities? And then I think there's hardware-centric programs that um, are taking... It's, it's a fundamental change in terms of how you think about this. It needs more education. Now, I'm very optimistic about that. Just today, the Army announced that they awarded us the, the, the Titan contract, which you can think of Titan as a, as a ground station on wheels. We think of it as the first AI-defined vehicle. You know, If Tesla made your car software-defined, we're making your weapon system AI-defined. And so you would typically think about, okay, well, what sort of company is going to deliver you a truck that is a ground station? you probably historically would not have thought of a software company. But, you know, being the first software prime to win a major hardware program, I think paves the way for the broader defense tech ecosystem to see how they can drive the sort of change that they were founded to do that our, that our troops so desperately need. You know, that framing brings to mind a really interesting question because eventually, think back to your most 1990s dot com. People thought of technology as being this own siloed thing, and eventually every company effectively becomes a technology company. So to your point around software company now getting involved in the hardware side, how long will we maybe sustain the barrier between defense and defense technologies as way of thinking about the industry and bracketing the different companies and approaches? 
I, I think it would be a sign of success and maturity where that distinction no longer makes sense, right? I, I think we probably have a good decade or so in front of us. And I've seen, I've seen this um, play out in a different way in the commercial world, where when technology disruption was first happening, the legacy commercial companies, they would go out and start hiring as many software engineers as possible. You would hear people quote things like, oh, you know, I have more software engineers than Oracle, not realizing... <laughs> Somehow they're measuring this on completely the wrong basis, right? Yeah, it's probably so a we, bad thing if you actually think they think that through logically. <laughs> exactly, but you, you know, because they're saying it from such a point of pride, it, it's hard to even engage in that level of, of unpacking it for them. Uh, and I think we see this now. So you know, we are now the sixth largest defense company by market cap, but we have three thousand eight hundred employees compared to hundreds of thousands for the other five or so companies, right? So software is not going to look like. Uh, the, the other traditional businesses. It's not going to be a hire for mass sort of play. You're really hiring for exquisite skills. Software requires a sort of culture. Again, a culture that is unique to America, but but as it doesn't exist everywhere in America. You know, you have to inculcate it within the companies. And I, I think you can see that transformation even with Tesla, where they spend more on software R&D than they do on hardware R&D. And so what, what is the future defense prime going to look like? I think it, it looks much more like this. I guess the real question here, Palantir finds itself in a weird place when it comes to the defense tech versus defense prime category because you've been around for a while. To your point, you've been doing this for 18 years. So you're no longer, I'd say, just like pure startup. Your direction would kind of like a legacy startup. I'm curious what takeaways you have from that transition and then what you see as just a couple of lessons that startups who are looking to transition in this early period in that direction should be thinking of. Yeah, really, I've taken those reflections into what I'm calling government web services. The best, you know, the, the thing that we had to eke out over 20 years is all this infrastructure, not our software but that the software infrastructure beneath it so that we could deliver modern software to the defense department. You can think about it as like a wormhole between modern American software and the environments where defense operates. How do you manage accreditation? How do you deploy to edge nodes? How do I write code low side that shows up high side? How do I integrate all this data from all of these legacy systems that we were just talking about in addition to new systems? That's all beta. If every company has to go reinvent that wheel, it's a huge amount of capital. It's a huge amount of time. It's highly inefficient. It's not improving lethality. I want to be able to give them essentially what I've built up over 20 years as inventory in my closet to get them to the starting line much faster so they can focus on the unique things that drive differentiation, of course, make them more successful, but ultimately drive improved outcomes of lethality to the warfighter. And, and that I think is, is um, we can do a lot of that between now and 2025, now and 2027. We're not going to do a lot of fielding exquisite systems in that same time period. You know, something we've kind of made reference to this a couple of times, but I think one of the most useful intellectual contributions you've made recently has been this idea of the first breakfast, because we're talking about legacy startups and primes and defense companies, but these all what all these topics are effectively doing are giving us a construction or a framework for understanding the defense ecosystem. Could you give us an explanation of what the first breakfast concept is saying about today and what it's obviously referencing back from the 1990s. Yeah, so I view the first breakfast as hopefully the antidote or part of the antidote to the Last Supper, which was the, this dinner, this famous dinner in 1993 where Les Aspen, it was organized by then De Deputy Secretary of Defense Bill Perry, they convened a large number of the what was then 51 primes to tell them we need a peace dividend. You know, it's 1993, the Soviet Union has fallen. We're going to dramatically slash defense spending. Um, they slashed it by 67%. So for every dollar before, there's only 33 cents left now. Not all of you are going to survive. And we're giving you permission and we're telling you that you're going to need to consolidate and get skinny in order to, to get through this next part. So start figuring that out as industry amongst yourself. Uh, and so we went from 51 primes down to five. The common historical narrative here, which is true, but I think actually is the lesser of the narratives, is, is something like this drove consolidation in the DIB, in the defense industrial base, which meant there was much less competition. But I think the consolidation, the greatest consequence of consolidation was conformity, that you essentially kicked off the financialization of defense. We went from a world where Chrysler used to have a missile division and General Mills, the serial company, made inertial guidance systems to a world where, no, you were going to be pure play defense. You're going to focus on this. 
um, it was all going to be highly financialized, which is to say, like, what really matters is what is your EBITDA? What are these leverage ratios look like? You know, it, it became much less about the technology and invention and risk. And as a consequence, it became much less about the entrepreneurs and the visionaries behind these institutions. We forget that it was Jack Northrop. It was Glenn Martin, not Northrop Grumman, not Martin Marietta. Right? And today we start to see this reemergence, this explosion of entrepreneurs, this creative energy, which has always been the driving force of this nation. And so getting them plugged back into that. So the first breakfast is really about convening a, vi- a venue where we can honor that, uh, empower those folks, support their their journey to delivering value in the in the defense department, and then kind of look at that and recognize really how do how should the monopsony behave in this context, uh, and and that is a dialogue between government and industry, which I think has really not happened since the early Cold War. Man, when you put it that way, it seems like the real difficulty from a public policy perspective here is we have competing objectives. So once again, 1990s objective is peace dividend, not deterrence insurance. If it's the 2000s, there's a debate of do we prepare for future conflicts of great powers or do we serve the actual warfighters on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan, especially during the height of the war in Iraq? Do you have a framework or maybe just some initial thoughts on how policymakers who aren't sitting in the tech industry or aren't sitting in the DOD, how should they think about the trade-offs and the priorities of this? I mean, maybe that's mobilization. Like maybe mobilization is just maybe that centerpiece of how once you conceive of this. I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah. But what strikes me when you say that, the most important recommendation I'd have is that innovation follows from productivity. If you're not making things, if you're not producing things, you cannot innovate on it. You know, Tim Cook says, look, I I don't make things in China because they're the cheapest. I make things in China because they're the best. Now, that wasn't true in the 90s. They were the cheapest. But as a consequence of 30 years of making things, they had the platform upon which to innovate. And as a consequence for us of having 30 years of not making things, we're left with hollow policy without an ability to translate. Our policy is not informed by the innovations that come from productivity. We produce a lot of software. We do, in fact, manufacture things. And now we've got to bring these things together. And I think this is why kind of almost priming the pump on reindustrialization is so important. Because even if it's not economic on at time t equals zero, it's never going to get there unless you invest in that productivity that then drives innovation. I, I've been thinking a lot about kind of an orthogonal topic to this. Why did it actually work? So, you know, at the period in time, let's call it from the late 40s to the mid 70s, when the government really drove most of R&D and the government really did have access to technology first, what's kind of different about that period than the current period? And I think when, when the government was driving the creation of technology and its implementation, it had a much stronger footing to have opinions on policy and regulation of that technology. If you were Rickover and you were building the nuclear navy, you couldn't just opine on the policy of, of <laughs> nuclear. You actually had to deliver the capability. And I think that made you better at both. Uh, now we've ended up in a world where that innovation is happening in, by and large, the private sector. The regulation, by necessity, is happening by and large in the public sector. And I think over time, this creates a sort of atrophy that we have to really manage and monitor. Uh, and so I think there, there has to be more space for industry voices to inform that. Of course, you have to guard against regulatory capture. On the flip side of this, I think we have to think about, because we're not, the genie's not going back in the bottle. We're not going back to a world where, you know, government's going to own technology, but it can go into a world where it's very aggressive and forward leaning and implementing technologies. When we look at the generative AI revolution, you know, DOD has been one of the slowest adopters of that, often with safety and, and, and uh, various like use case concerns. They're kind of, they're well-founded concerns, but I don't think you can solve and manage those policy issues by doing nothing and thinking your way through it. I think you actually earn the right to have an opinion by using that stuff in the mud, so to speak, not in the literal mud, but in the sense that I'm trying to solve use cases. I'm trying to improve um, how TRICARE works. You know, not all, not all of these use cases are about the kill chain, but by implementing the technology, I've earned an opinion. And I, I think we, we could do more to elevate that sort of thinking. Is there an institution or organization where you've been impressed by how quickly they've been adopting or at least experimenting with these AI use cases? In in general, when you look at the smaller, more nimble institutions that have uh, a lot at stake, you know, you, you could look at special operations as a community. 
Um, but I think actually the places that I've seen the adoption happen has been in, in the civilian sector. So like the CDC is now using this sort of AI technology to more quickly process receipts to go after root causes of, you know, what lettuce and what stores were actually the cause of this foodborne illness. And you can just feed in a bunch of the images of receipts and get a, a lot more information out. The FAA has been using this to, to implement when someone reports, uh, I saw a drone one kilometer west of my location. How do I turn that from an unstructured document to a geo point on a map? To, you know, so how do I in integrate this. Again, I would say all the value comes from this elegant integration of your humans, traditional software, and this AI. But you see a lot of um, uh, a lot of impetus, energy, innovation, and in how they're going after solving these sorts of problems. Before I close us out on a couple of topics you've been just sort of putting your thought into, and of course, folks could follow up on, I would love to talk about something that's near and dear to both you and my hearts. During our realignment episode, we got in a bit of a friendly debate about the type of the the word for describing the type of folks we need to be bringing in to address us all these problems. You said um, the term is like we need founders, very much bringing to mind um, the technology industry and how you think of Steve Jobs as a founder. You think of Elon Musk as a founder. And then I was sort of the DC quibbler. And I said, well, well, technically, a lot of the folks that you're talking about who were so impressive, well, John Boyd, who was on your list wasn't a founder, but at, at, a, at a core level, we were describing types of folks who be brought who should be brought into the process right now. So, I'd love for you, you could pick whatever words you want to pick here. I'm just giving context. Talk about who and what should be coming in to these spaces now that there is so much just clear opportunity and capital interest and focus going on in the first place. Yeah, I. I enjoyed that discussion a lot because I think it, it did point out a, a real flaw in the categorization here. I think we, we kind of used the term David, um, maybe, maybe as opposed to Goliath. Maybe there's a version of this that's also more like uh, an artist. You know, there's something fundamentally creative, disruptive, uh, inventive, and that sort of talent needs protection as well. So there, there, there's, mm. there's two sides of this coin, right? There is the unique individual who has the creativity and the ability and having an environment in which they they can succeed often requires a talent manager, someone who understands their uniqueness, the rough edges, um, and can support them. And so I think we have these people in this country in spades. It, it, it's, it's one of the most unique things about, you know, I, I, people who are not lemmings, people who think from first principles, um, huge amount of surface area for creation. And we need to be mindful of how we protect the space for them to, to be creative and deliver. I think one of the greatest anti-patterns around this is a drive towards consolidation, a drive towards efficiency. I'm not sure the creative process is efficient. And so the idea like, well, we should have one organization that's pursuing this. Why do we have duplicative lines of effort? I mean, duplicative lines of effort is almost a precondition for this sort of innovation to occur. When you from a very pragmatic level, when we were developing submarine launch ballistic missiles, we had four concurrent efforts going on and it bought down risk. And the historical analysis of that would say we spent less because we did four things in parallel and could learn faster to get to the ultimate goal. But even, even besides that, I think in any sort of business, when I reflect on my job at Palantir, one of the most important responsibilities I have is granting and revoking monopolies on projects. Are you the sole effort that's driving this company in this direction? Or are you one of several efforts and you have to earn the right that this internal competition dynamic actually is really important? Uh, because there's uncertainty on my end. I don't know the answer. How could I possibly pick one of you? And if the problem's important enough, of course it's worth having multiple bites at the apple. Now that becomes my central management job. At some point, there is enough data. At some point, you do have to make a call. But you don't want to pursue the aesthetic of efficiency to, to a pathological end where essentially you never get anything that works because you did it efficiently. And, you know, that actually perfectly ties together the point you were making about the consequences of the Last Supper, because we're describing these individuals who need to be creative and nonconformist. Like your whole point was that era demanded by its very necessity conformity. So not only are those people not attracted to the industry, to the government tasks, but should those people be there in the first place, you weren't going to have a moment where the various idiosyncrasies or to your point, inefficiencies wouldn't just be laundered out as problematic to the actual objective. And that's why our earlier conversation about maybe trying to have government identify the hinge point, hinge point objective, our focus is mobilization. 
identifying on that policy area and that objective would actually make it easier for, once again, to your point, managers, industries, sectors, individuals to justify the way that those nonconformists are approaching it. So I think that's really key. Um, Let me throw in one more idea, which might take us backwards a little bit, but I think as a policy recommendation, it's also probably the most heretical, which is that we need to get rid of cost plus contracting. That actually, you, you know, in a world where you're doing cost plus, you need the customer to believe what you're doing. The customer is essentially paying for your R&D. Uh, they're financing everything. It, it is pro-conformity, and it's going to weed out all the unconventional ideas. What you really want to do is shift the balance to a place where, no, you as the private citizen, as industry, put up your money. Go, go convince investors in this country that has the most dynamic, deepest capital markets. Go convince them that your approach has merit. Prove it to the government and then sell it in a competitive way on a firm fixed price basis. Cost reasonableness is not based on a markup on your underlying costs, but based on what the alternatives are to the government. What value does this actually create? You know, we would never run our American private markets through a cost plus mentality. We would, we would do it through value. It, you, you couldn't imagine. So if you, let's say there's an existing system, it's, it costs a billion dollars. There's 10% profit on that. It's a cost plus contract. If someone came around with the better mousetrap that cost half as much, half, $500 million, but it had 50% profit margins, that would be deemed excessive profit, even though you're saving the taxpayer $500 million. So the whole system is geared up in a way where the maverick has, even if they get to the point where they can deliver something interesting, has no point of surviving the valley of death structurally. Uh, and then structurally, we're empowering the people who are going to be turning the crank. Uh, instead of giving more surface area to people who are going to come up and invent big new ideas that could actually move the ball forward. You know, here's the key thing that really gets to the theme of the show that you identified. Lots of folks in the defense tech venture space, um, I've interviewed Trey Stevens of Anderil and Founders Fund about this, will focus on the cost plus contracting issue. But if you don't take those policy choices and place them in a broader societal political context, you aren't going to be able to, I think, get to the right policy mix. The key thing is that cost plus contracting emerges out of the 1960s. It emerges out of A, like post-military industrial complex skepticism, Vietnam War skepticism, um, Secretary McNamara is trying to hold down costs in those areas. There's obviously a specific environment that created the conditions where that was the politically viable choice to proceed and then maintain moving forward. What I think FDR um, and his administration did so effectively during the mobilization period is tie these concepts together into a political construct and a framework. It's not just that yeah. we need to spend money on factories and mobilization. It's that, hey, there is this threat. There is this problem. There is this challenge and it fits in there. And what I would like to see policymakers do is pick up the baton you're um, you know, handing off when it comes to the cost plus contracting, but it needs to be integrated into a broader political or societal argument of what we are trying to actually achieve. Once again, that's the mobilization concept there. So I think that's just like a note of how we need to do our best to get these various sectors, not just sectors, but like approaches to the world to really integrate well. Because I think we've had a few years of folks in industry talking about cost plus contracting being an issue, but outside of your most like defense walkie members um, and, you know, bureaucrats and such, it's not exactly a policy area of it's taking the world by storm, like even in foreign and defense policy circles. So I think that's just like a quick reaction um, I have to, I think that very valid point. No, I think that's very valid. Clearly you, you, people have been talking about it, but it seems very narrow. Uh, but I think the consequences continue to build because it actually relates to the monopsony. If you believe in the monopsony, that the monopsony is the only way you can buy things, cost plus is probably the right way to do it then. I don't know how else you would decide fairness. Mm. Uh, the more you believe in the market, uh, the more you realize this is this is becomes self fulfilling and prevents the market from even getting started because there's not enough margin. And if you produce a lower price good instead of what would happen in the private sector where you win, you actually lose. You're shrinking the profit that's available to you. So it, it's so pr pr profoundly distorted. And this is where I would go back to the earlier part of, of the the show where we talk about the monopsony being something we need to look really hard at and and understand the unintended consequences of continuing to stick with it. So let's just close here. We were emailing back and forth before um, the episode, and you just raised some like really interesting ideas that you were sort of riffing on. I think it'd be interesting uh, for folks who just kind of raise a couple of these ideas. You could give kind of a quick summary of where your thoughts are, and folks who are 
of interest, especially in the audience, could like pick up um, the Slack, get in touch, all those different categories. So uh, first off, I'll just like tee you up and you take it wherever you want to go. Um, you've been putting a lot of thought into how the, there's a lot of lore around the idea of like free and open source software when it's not actually free. Um, explain what you mean by that. Yeah, so uh, oftentimes we're finding ourselves in a position where the government says, look, I don't want to pay for software. Software ought to be free. So I'm not even going to consider potential solutions that don't involve free software or open source software. Uh, and I think what we need to recognize is that actually open source is itself a business strategy. That strategy has come about to commoditize your complements. The simplest example is if you're an application software company or a database software company, there's only so much share of wallet at the customer. And so you're competing over the same dollars, essentially. Now, if you as application companies can come together and make an open source database that's free, that means you're going to shrink the share that goes to the database providers. You're going to increase the amount of wallet that's available to you. This has been a powerful deflationary force. It's good. It's good that they're all, I could choose to buy a database. I could choose to use the free database. It, this one better be good enough that it justifies <laughs> the value over free. This is promoting innovation. The pathology is really where you say, no, I refuse to buy licensed software. I'm only going to go with free software. Then who are you commoditizing? You're commoditizing all commercial software and, and the, all the value accretes to the systems integrators who charge by the hour. All the value accretes to the cost plus providers. So we need to recognize that there is an unintentional alignment between the monopsony who kind of feels like, why should I pay for software? And the SIs in preserving the status quo around cost plus. Uh, and so I, I think some people misinterpreted my, my piece there to be anti-open source. I'm not. We have 200 open source projects. We're major contributors. But let's be clear-eyed that we do that not because we think it's a political movement, free software. We do it because we want to commoditize our compliments too. And this is how we are paying forward into the innovation of the ecosystem. And I want to elevate that discourse in government so they understand what's, what are the dynamics that are actually happening. Why are people spending millions of dollars to create free software? Next one that I found particularly interesting is this idea of IP vendor lock and um, switching costs when we're actually looking at these programs. I think this is a place where, where DOD is maybe two decades behind the commercial world. You know, the commercial world has also had to deal with the idea that we're going to be vendor locked into decisions we make. We're going to buy software or hardware, different components. The whole discourse in the commercial world has switched from vendor lock and avoiding it at all costs to switching costs. Let's recognize that any decision I make is going to have some amount of lock-in. The question is, am I locked in for two hours, two weeks, two decades? And by triaging this, I'd understand how much, how much regret will I have by making the decision? How do I manage uh, and measure switching costs over time and treat this as a problem to be managed as opposed to a problem to be solved? I think when you treat it as a problem to be solved, it leads to certain pathologies because actually the reality is every decision has some amount of lock-in. So let's close here. Um, you've put a lot of thought into the vertical, vertical integration topic. Yes. Yeah, so I think by law now, um, you know, all systems are supposed to be modular open systems, MOSA as the word is, and I support that generally. But I also want to make sure, and this is something Liz Stein from USIT brought up recently, that we're aware of the consequences. When you think of the eye-watering performance of Apple's M1 chip, which is just you know, better battery life, better machine learning performance, better compute, Better on, you know, better on every dimension. The M1 chip is a, is a consequence of the co-optimization of hardware and software. Apple made that chip, controlling the software that ran on the chip and controlling the silicon that implements that chip. And that was an iterative process. Now, if, you, if you're going to go all in on MOSA, you're going to give up the opportunities for that sort of exquisite hardware software co-optimization. What you may now buy yourself in reduction of vendor lock you're going to also buy yourself in reduction of capabilities. So I think these two conversations of switching costs and, uh, um, and MOSA go hand in hand. I am, again, for the record, pro MOSA, but we can't somehow think that there are no trade-offs to that and that we need to have some sort of nuanced space for people to present opportunities for hardware software co-optimization that deliver increased lethality. That is an excellent place to leave it. Sean, as I've said multiple times, you've got a lot of great writing and resources out there. If a listener who's particularly invested in this topic wants to learn more, like what's like a piece or two that you just recommend starting with to get your real thought process out? Yeah, I think the best place to start was, is with the first post on the first breakfast, firstbreakfast.com. It really sets out how are we going to go from the last supper to the first breakfast? 
And a lot of the pieces there are, are designed to kind of shift the Overton window. How can we have conversations about new ideas that um, really foster a broader defense tech ecosystem that meet this present geopolitical moment we're in that honor what's truly exceptional about America? Excellent. Thank you for joining me on Arsenal of Democracy. Thanks for having me, Marshall. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit subscribe below so you don't miss any episodes of Arsenal of Democracy. If you'd like to learn more about the topics covered on this episode or just are interested in broader content on U.S. foreign and domestic policy, be sure to go to Hudson.org. See you soon.